Good morning. Thank you for joining us at the 2021 Economic Development Forum. The theme for this year's EDF is the new reality, the journey of recovery and resiliency for businesses and communities. Over the next two days, we will discuss issues, challenges, realities, solutions, and strategies that both business and community can use on this recovery join me journey. Please join me in welcoming uh, Della Clark. Della has served as president and CEO of the Enterprise Center, affectionately known as TEC, since 1992. And in 2012, she founded the TEC CC, which is a U.S. Small Business Administration microloan intermediary, a community development financial institution, community developed entity, SBA, community advantage leader, and certified Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Community Bank. Under the leadership of Della, the TECCC has invested primarily debt with some equity in minority owned businesses. She also founded in 2001, the Enterprise Center Community Development Corporation, which spearheads economic projects, such as commercial kitchen, urban fair, and other real estate projects, primarily in West Philadelphia. Della received a Bachelor of Science in American, at American University, Washington, DC in 1975, and served as a senior policy fellow at George B. Voinovich Center for Leadership and Public Affairs at Ohio University from 1998 to 2000. She's also an Eisenhower Fellow. During her tenure, Della has performed as a highly motivated and accomplished management professional with over 29 years of service to urban enterprises. She's proven, has a proven ability to implement effective initiatives with, consistent, with a consistent record of highly visible results in linking economic growth, business capital, and community, and has demonstrated expertise in the conceptualization of ideas, resource determination, and final implementation. Her ability to initiate change and impact while utilizing excellent presentation, communication, and leadership skills has enabled Della to spearhead growth and revenue strategies in alignment with mission, generate revenue, boost organizational visibility, and financial stability. Under her leadership since 2004, TEC, has helped small businesses earn more than $1 billion in contracts and financing, secure more than $7 million in startup loans, and created more than 3,000 jobs for the local community. She's led a successful organization with a $5 million annual budget with more than 39 full-time, part-time, and interns. Programs include the U.S. Department of Commerce Minority Business Development Agency Business Center of Pennsylvania, and the U.S. Department of Transportation Small Business Transportation Resource Center. Della is currently launching an equity fund with an investment thesis to scale minority enterprise. The fund will focus on minority enterprise standouts in Philadelphia and surrounding mid-Atlantic region. She's fundraising primarily on, she's primarily focusing on fundraising, deal sourcing, and executing transactions. She will also act as advisor and coach to portfolio companies specifically related to business growth opportunities post investment. Uh, yes, Della, I read the entire thing. I'm pleased to introduce my friend Della Clark to the 2021 virtual EDF attendees. Della, we'd like to invite Della to provide some opening comments. Joselle, thank you. And I did not want you to read that whole bio, but thank you, Joanne, Joselle. Uh, good, good for me, it's good afternoon. I think for all of you, it's still probably good morning in the Memphis area. And I am delighted to join my good friend, um, Joselle. I would just add a few additional uh, descriptions of our work at the Enterprise Center. So we primarily sit on three pillars to make it real simple, business, capital, and community. And the reason that the community is so important to us is because we want to 
grow and scale minority enterprises who want to do well and do good in their respective communities and help their neighborhoods to grow and to prosper. Uh, and capital, as you all know, is the number one disruptor of minority enterprises and small businesses in general. So we want to make sure resources are available to them. And then finally, entrepreneurship business, uh, which is the significant pillar on which we uh, sit on for the past 30 years. And so I'm delighted to um, share kind of the successes as well as the failures and the experiences that I've had in working with minority enterprises uh, in the city of Philadelphia and how we now are looking at um, the um, growth that's gonna come out of this pandemic that we've been in and how do we pivot into what we call the hot industries. So Joselle, thank you very much. And I look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Della. So I, I'm not sure, Della, if you had an opportunity uh, to be with us a few moments ago or earlier this morning when we heard from Christine Self from Deloitte present her 2021 Global Resilience Report. So for those of you that are participating in, in this session and you were not able to hear Christine's presentation, uh, I want to just share a little bit about that to you to help frame the conversation that Della and I are going to have. Well, Deloitte surveyed over 2,600 C-suite executives across 21 countries to understand how those organizations were coping with the unexpected challenges they faced in the past year and to tap their opinions about what made their organizations more or less able to withstand the disruption. So Della, I'd like to onshore this conversation by overlaying the findings of the Deloitte study on our two cities using the minority and small business organizations in both as the data sets for the discussion. The purpose of this discussion is to shine the light on where we are collectively as a global community of businesses in this new reality and why it is vitally important for minority and small businesses to understand how non-minority corporations and organizations are addressing disruption and preparing for the recovery journey in order to pivot, shift, and make adjustments within their own organizations. But also, it is important to note that many minority and small business organizations were able and did withstand the disruption. So to get started, I'd like to share a few statistics about our cities, which will share the stark differences, but yet the similarities between the two. The population of Philadelphia is approximately 1.6 million people compared to Memphis's 651,000. 64% of Memphis's population is black compared to 44% of Philadelphia. The 2012 census reported 49,000 black businesses in Philadelphia compared to about 44,000 in Memphis. The poverty rates are 23% and 25% in Philadelphia and Memphis respectively. So both cities have a large black population center, similar number of black businesses and poverty rate percentages are fairly close. And then the key findings of the Deloitte study were resilient organizations outperform in times of disruption. The 2020 uh, year accelerated resilience for some organizations and exposed gaps for others. But then finally, it showed that resilience is deliberate. Deloitte identified five attributes of resilient organizations that enable and promote nimble strategies, adaptive cultures, and the implementation and effective use of advanced technology. The study went on to say, businesses that can bounce back from unexpected challenges typically are prepared, adaptable, collaborative, trustworthy and responsible. So as we talk about minority and small business organizations today, I would like us to talk about what we learned about the state of minority and small businesses relative to two things. One, major issues and challenges the, minor the majority of businesses had to recover from as a result of the disruption caused by the pandemic. And then two, after hearing Deloitte's five attributes of resilient organizations, what key actions 
must minority and small businesses take to position themselves to withstand future disruptions? So Della, let's get started. So I think, um, Jose, one of the big things that we recognize in Philadelphia was is that about 67% of our minority enterprises were not technology ready. They, they were not equipped with advanced technology. So they could not pivot as an example if they were a retailer to e-commerce, right? And so in many cases, as you know, we went immediately to a virtual environment where your computer had to have a camera and audio. Many of them did not, right? And, and so there were many issues um, uh, associated with the technology that came about from the um, pandemic and working from home. The second thing that we recognize from the pandemic is that many of our small businesses had very little cash reserve. Because as you know, it was a sudden shutdown from the federal government last March, and you got caught when they said, we're gonna shut down for two weeks. It, it, it shut people down and they had very little cash reserve. Some did, and so as you speak about resilience, those who had some cash reserve was able to sustain the storm that came. Those who did not, that's why we've had a significant amount of shutdowns of minority businesses that may not be able to come back as we come out of this pandemic and as we continue to now struggle with the add-on of this Delta variant that's coming about. All right. So thank you for that. So I'd like to now start our discussion uh, about talking about the industry mix of minority businesses served by our organizations in the last year and the major impacts observed. In most cities, tourism, retail, and restaurants were hit the hardest because those industries were closed first to slow the spread. In Memphis, the businesses we served over the last year were primarily in service, distribution, construction, and construction related trades. Businesses in those industries were excluded from the initial shutdowns, just as you said a moment ago, and were the, for the most part unaffected if they were of the size and scale to have multi-year contracts and purchase orders with major companies and governmental entities that remained fully operational. Conversely, business in those industries were not of the size and scale to have multi-year contracts, but whose operational model was low dollar, repetitive contracts and orders. Those businesses were the first to suffer loss of revenue and were at risk to survive because corporate and governmental entities re remain fully operational, uh, continue to shift toward their day-to-day -day purchasing needs to provide personal protective equipment purchases and place many projects on hold to preserve cash. The result impact on to minority and small businesses was employee layoffs, business closures, the depletion of cash reserves, and in some instances, pivots. So we'll talk about some of that later. So Della, tell us about Philadelphia. Well, I think what has happened is, is that we all here in Philadelphia have come to realize that we got to collaborate more, um, that this pandemic caused us to really take a look at the past 30, 40 years and the way we were doing business. And, you know, one of the things that have come to realize is that if you keep doing the same things that you were doing prior to the pandemic, you will get the same results post pandemic. So a group of us leaders have come together here in Philadelphia and said, okay, what kind of functioning service providers do we need that can help these small businesses pivot? Because some of these small businesses need some handholding, Joselle, they need capital, they need uh, some other resources. Um, they have to learn now how to put together a far more sophisticated response to an RFP because of the competitiveness of the environment, because some of the bigger businesses are hurting as well. So, so they're, they're coming back to some of the smaller contracts, right? And so the competition has become, become more competitive 
in getting contracts. So, so minorities have to step up their game. And so we are looking at ways that, for instance, here in the city of Philadelphia, we took all of our city agencies, we looked at how much they outsource, we looked at what are all of our quasi cities organizations outsource, and that number is about $6.5 billion. So we're saying, okay, what components of that could we allocate to minority businesses? And then we're going to look at the next portfolio of our large nonprofits, medical, education, uh, and then we're going to look at the private sector. But we now have to lay out that path to recovery for our small businesses and, and align all of the resources commensary with their scale and the commensary of the contracts to get them to the next level. So I think for the first time that I've been in this work of minority business, I'm seeing some intentionality that I've never seen before. And so I, you know, I don't want to say this um, without being mindful of the ramification, but I think two things occurred in America that impacted both of our cities. One was the pandemic, which slowed us down and gave us a chance to think, but the other one was the death of George Floyd, right? And I think that woke up America in ways that we couldn't have never imagined. And uh, I think this is a historic moment in our country. And working you know, side by side as two different cities, we need to figure out how we can capture, capture that and help our small businesses actually jump forward in, 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 in mighty ways, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And so while the impacts were common in both our cities, I think the approaches uh, to designing and mitigating those impacts uh, are going to be different. So I wanna pause here uh, for a moment um, and address and respond to some of the things that you shared that were going on in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, and similar things are going on here, but, and it's being done by three different organizations. And so one of the things that was very, um, when you talked about how you looked at spend opportunities and money that was being spent outside of the city of Philadelphia in the area and to bring that, those funds back in. Here mm -hmm. in Memphis, there are three organizations that work, just, no, three organizations that work uh, together. Our organization, uh, as long as the Greater Memphis Chair, uh, Chamber of Commerce, and then there's another organization called the Medical District Collaborative. All three of our organizations have a local spin uh, initiative that is similarly uh, looking at the kinds of spin and really the outcomes and the impacts that spending funds that go outside the community and the city are doing. And the more we can work collaborative, collaboratively and collectively together, we can have a greater impact on those funds that can stay in this community. And so you're absolutely correct. The impacts were different, uh, but I think everyone, we did exactly as you said, it allowed us to slow down and to think and really look at what's happening in our city. And I'm sure we're going to continue to do that because like we've said, recovery is a journey and not a destination. And we're gonna be on this recovery journey for a while. And I think we will have a lot of time. Uh, and, and I like your, uh, the phrase that you, that you use, we're gonna have a lot of time to sit back and think about some of the things that have happened. And then was, it's time to pull those like minds together and start putting some actions in place to really take uh, advantage of where we are with these challenges and turn those challenges into, into opportunities. And so I appreciate you uh, for those comments. But I did wanna ask if you could um, share an example uh, of a business in Philadelphia that was able to recover and pivot from an impact uh, that was imposed upon it by the pandemic? Yes, we took a, a janitorial, I mean, not a janitorial, I'm sorry, a construction firm that was an HVAC company. And as a result of the pandemic uh, here in Philadelphia, construction work slowed down tremendously. And it probably slowed down more in a big city like Philadelphia than it did in Memphis. And quite frankly, Joselle, many of our work is still remote from home. And our construction still is not quite back to the same level it was post bank, I mean, pre-pandemic, but it is coming back. And so this HVAC company, we were able to help him pivot. And because COVID was running rampant in our city and in our state, we were able in, in Harrisburg, our capital, help him get a contract that, uh, because at that point, they, it was always attributed to services. And so we, uh, he established a business called Disinfect USA. And 
he was able to take an application from the food industry and use that application and this product to start cleaning surfaces, doorknobs, elevating buttons, railings on stairwells, because at that point, everybody was afraid to touch anything if you didn't have a glove on. And so it was through that business and, and he did that at, until the um, pandemic was under control. And now he has moved his business to more an emergency response. So if it is a school, if it's a church and you have a COVID situation, he's like the Ghostbusters movie. He would go in and he would uh, uh, use his disinfect product and clean the environment where there had been people who's been tested positive. So we think that's an opportunity also to pool together some of our smaller janitorial firms who can do some of that work. So we've kind of created a consortium around the pandemic and help some small businesses well, because of offices being closed, many of our janitorial firms was hurting because they didn't, nobody, everyone's working remotely. So we were able to put them to work in this uh, consortium. Wonderful, wonderful. Great example, great example. Um, and so I want to shift a minute and, you know, everybody, I wanted everybody to, to hear uh, your, your bio and your experience uh, on the financial side and the fundraising side and all the great things that you do to provide capital uh, to businesses across uh, Philadelphia and the Mid-Atlantic region. And so the Enterprise Center operates the CDFI and you recently became uh, licensed as an SBIC. Now that's a lot of alphabets and I may not have all of them correctly, uh, but tell us about how you are able to serve minority businesses and small businesses in your area and across the country. So what has led us to think more broadly about capital is because if you took the same business plan and you gave that business plan to an entrepreneur from a low wealth, underserved community, where there's very little resources in terms of family wealth, that business is going to start and grow and scale fundamentally different from a business with the same business plan from the entrepreneur, from a middle upper class, from a prosperous community, because they're able to probably aggregate anywhere between 75 and $250,000 from family and friends to start that business. So by the time they get to, let's say three to 5 million in revenue, their balance sheet's not out of whack because they're debt to equity. They didn't take all debt to start their business. And so when you look at the capital stack, of minority enterprises, when they reach a certain scale, usually the retained earnings is not as positive as it should be. Their EBITDA could be negative. And you know, there's just a hole in that capital stack. And this is what Joselle has led us to really focus on, on debt and equity in terms of a blended capital model, because you cannot grow to significant scale without debt. And so while I love CDFIs, and we certainly have a CDFI in our umbrella, we found it to be limited in that it only could take an entrepreneur to a certain level in that capital stack. And that you don't want, want to be broken your businesses to banks all the time because they end up with more and more debt on their balance sheet. And so this was the reason we decided to apply for an SBIC license under the SBA. And so that when a client comes to us, we will have both debt and equity to help them grow their business. Yes, great. So what, would, what advice would you give business owners tuned in to this conference today about seeking out either local CDFIs as an additional finance, a financial resource provider, or other uh, sources such as an SBIC? Well, um, they, they, CDFIs do many different things. There are some CDFIs that are into housing. They are into consumer products. I would say, first of all, find out if the CDFI makes small business loans. If they do, what's the size they go up to? Because it depends on where you are in your trajectory of growth. It could be appropriate for you in your early stage. But as you start to grow and get larger, then you need different other forms of capital. You want that CDFI to help broker you to the banks if they can, because you have a track record with them if you paid their loan back. Um, if you don't go to a CDFI and you go straight to a bank, then that's where your balance sheet becomes very, very important, right? And so I really want to encourage Joselle uh, entrepreneurs to pay attention to their balance sheet. There's two things that makes the difference in the growth of their business. One is the balance sheet, the other is their track record. 
And so you have to focus on those. And so if you want to take larger jobs, people want to see your balance sheet. So you, you have to focus on that. And most people only want to go, they don't want to invest in, in audited financials or review financials. They don't want to spend time with a CPA or accountant on a regular basis. They, they need to become their best friend. There's, there's two things. You need an, a good attorney and you need a good accountant. They need to become your best friends and you need to meet with them on a regular basis. Not just when your taxes are due or not just when you're going to get a loan. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that many of our small businesses make. They don't want to make either one of those investments. Absolutely. Investment is the right word. And looking at it as an investment and not as an expense will really okay. change the trajectory of their businesses. So thank okay. you. Thank you for that. Uh, so I want to switch a minute. So that's great conversation. And I'm sure we're going to get questions in the chat uh, at the end of this session by our participants. And I want to encourage them now to start putting your questions in the chat and we'll get to them uh, at the end of the session. But I want to switch because, you know, at the very beginning, I started out saying that I wanted to bring our conversation uh, back to resiliency and the impact of the pandemic and what we need to do in order to move forward. So switching to resiliency, we know there are a lot of minority and small businesses that while they were fortunate enough to survive the disruption, they have fallen behind. Um, they have fallen behind uh, in the pack on this recovery journey. So of the five attributes that Deloitte identified in resilient organizations, which do you think those businesses that were able to survive, those that you mentioned, one, uh, was an HVAC firm, but he had your help. But others that you know, which of those businesses were able to survive because they were either prepared, uh, adaptive, or they had collaborative, trustworthy, or responsible attributes? Well, one of the things that we have noticed is that there are, there are a lot more um, um, people from the service provider industry from, as you mentioned earlier in your remarks about restaurant workers, uh, hospitality workers, you know, they're not going back to those jobs, Joselle. And one of the reasons I think they found entrepreneurship, right? And I know a story of someone who said their neighbor lost his job and he decided to go buy a lawnmower. And he started cutting all the grass in his neighborhood and in the community. And he's generating enough money now that he's not going back to a job. And so I think that we are finding out resilience goes all the way up and down and across because people have found ways now to survive. And I don't think that people are just dependent on unemployment benefits. I think people have become entrepreneurs. So the businesses that uh, have been resilient out of the pandemic are ones that it's just part of their nature, right? Those entrepreneurs have that skill set to say, okay, if I have a dress shop or have a food restaurant and it's closed up, no customers coming in, what can I do? Some of them have started having, um, you know, uh, getting, uh, doing, uh, go going on eBay. Some of them are doing other different type products. So we, and some of them have gotten into uh, seamstress where they repair garments, you know, and thrift shops have become a lot more popular now. So I think there's a number of ways that people have pivoted in these uh, commercial corridors as well as, as the larger businesses have. And I think there are some new industries that are coming. We saw many of our small businesses pivot selling PPP products from masks to gloves to the uh, selling to hospitals. So we saw a number of entrepreneurs that are able to pivot. Now, I don't want to say this because I don't know about it in Memphis, but in terms of restaurants, as soon as they started allowing to sell takeout liquor, uh, restaurants revenue started to go back up. Now here in Pennsylvania, I don't know about in Tennessee, but you can no longer sell takeout drinks. Mm -hmm. They stopped, right? right. It, is, it did not make it permanent. But that did help the restaurants to be able to pivot by selling uh, drinks as takeout. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we saw that here as well. I think that might've been a national um, model that they saw they could start selling look, uh, alcohol, alcoholic beverages on takeout and they did that. We've seen businesses shift and pivot. The PPP um, shortage did create opportunities, especially for business owners that had additional relationships with distributors for other products. It allowed yeah. them to enter into uh, that market and they may have had the ability to access that supply when some of the larger companies could not. 
But yeah, you are absolutely right. And, and it is the entrepreneurial spirit. And you'll probably, what you're describing is what we saw, and I'm sure you saw in Philadelphia after the um, economic downturn of 2007. And that was when the, you know, the opportunity entrepreneur uh, phrase was coined, where people lost their jobs as a result of that. They got laid off, they got downsized, and they did just that. They went out and bought a lawnmower. Uh, or they identified other things that they could do because they still had to take care, take care of their families. So excellent. And, and I believe that minority and small businesses must implement resiliency as a strategic and an organizational imperative to position their businesses to survive this recovery journey. I believe now I believe the two most important attributes are prepared and adaptable. Um, and as major corporations across all industries took and are taking key actions across workforce, technology, uh, strategy areas, minority and small businesses, they must do the same as well. Now, workforce nationwide is a major issue facing all communities. Uh, the demand for employees is a national issue and there's no community that's immune. And it is the resilient organizations, those investing in technology, and training and workforce and the culture of the workforce, they will most definitely be uh, the winners uh, in the jobs war. Now, before the end of this conversation, I'm gonna ask again, if anyone is uh, has a burning question that they'd like to ask, please post your questions in the Q&A and we will answer them when there is time. But uh, lastly, uh, as a minority economic development practitioner, Della, have you seen any new issues being faced by minority and small businesses during this pandemic that you've not seen over the years you've been operating in this space? Uh, and if so, can you share them with us and, and what you think they need to do going forward? I think since the pandemic and, and the collective approach we've taken to have serious conversation with uh, what we call the deciders in our city, uh, who gets the business both on the private sector and public sector side. I think they shine the spotlight on the uh, racial injustices as how contracts are awarded. You know, years ago, Joselle, when public sectors decided that they were gonna allow minority participation on, on city and state contracts, and as well as federal, right? Uh, probably the, many of the deciders didn't look like me, right, at the table. And so what has come about is how these contracts are awarded, right? And you know, if you have the same people at the table awarding contracts, then minorities get left out. Because sometimes it's not because we're not bidding, it's because they don't want us to get the business. So I think what has happened since the pandemic is that the flashlight is on how we decide who gets contracts and how do we become a more just economy and environment and have an ecosystem that minorities know that if they put together a competitive uh, response to RFP, if they able to have the capital reserve for it, that they're given an opportunity to get that contract. And so, so many times entrepreneurs put all they have into proposals and contracts and then they don't get them or, or they're a sub of a sub of a sub. I think we have to stop that. And I think that we have to allow minorities to become more primes and help them create the kind of what I call elephants that we need. You know, many cities across America have mostly mice. And that's because we don't give them enough to eat and feed and we have to do that with our contracts. So at this time, I understand we have a question uh, in the chat. The question is, what are the hot industries that have emerged and thrived during the pandemic? I think one of them is uh, research labs. So as an example here in Philadelphia, it is trying to become a hot bed for gene therapy. While we don't have minorities in gene therapy, as an example, we can break down the supply chains of gene therapy and get minorities plugged in for opportunities. Uh, hospitals is a hot bed for activities. Uh, they need a lot more storage. They need accessibility to medical supplies. If you have warehousing and you can convert those into clean warehouses, clean rooms within your warehouses, you can get contract opportunities. Um, because staffing is such an issue for many organizations, staffing, uh, setting up staffing organizations, as, as uh, Joselle mentioned, kind of if you're able to bring together the culture 
and the kind of uh, workers that people are looking for, this is a good time to start a staffing business and help uh, connect these uh, employers to workers that they're looking for, because that's gonna be a whole new generation of workers that's gonna come about. Uh, I think one of the other hot industries that we need to be mindful of is the federal government. I have never, Joselle, in my 30 years seen this much money being talked about out of the federal government. Here's an opportunity for you to pursue and, and look at that American Rescue Plan and pay attention because there's trillions of dollars coming out of Washington. Uh, eventually that infrastructure bill will be passed. I think there's gonna be a real opportunity for black and brown businesses to get into construction, infrastructure, bridges, highways, and those things. I think those are hot industries that we need to start preparing ourselves for now. Wonderful, great, great, great answers. Um, and, and I hope the uh, companies that are listening on the chat took note uh, of those responses that you gave and um, would, are, are poised and really thinking about how they can really look at entering into new markets. Uh, and there are various ways to do that. You know, they can, you can enter into a new market through a joint venture, uh, through a strategic alliance, uh, look at your own you know, business, make some uh, transition uh, into some new area. So there are lots of opportunities for that. Do we have any other questions in the chat? No other questions in the chat. So uh, Della, based on what, you know, you've covered a lot with us uh, today uh, in, in describing and sharing uh, what's happening in Philadelphia, uh, the information that you, and the advice that you gave to uh, business owners about really looking at their uh, finances, their, their balance sheets, you know, really understanding their business, uh, the, the importance of uh, having their own CPA that they meet with regularly uh, to talk about th their records and just how important, how important that is. Uh, I'm glad you shared that. Uh, I think that is something, that's one of the things that we found uh, over the last year as we too were working with uh, small businesses and providing technical assistance with CPAs is that that is a resource that I think that is often not taken advantage of uh, as often. Uh, and it could be business owners, and I don't know if you saw that in Philadelphia, business owners' reluctance to bringing forth their financials and laying them bare uh, before someone uh, that could really give them some counsel uh, and advice. And I don't know if you all share that. I do know that you talked about uh, in a conversation that we had some time ago about how your organization, and I think the words that you used uh, where you all had to look under the hood and really look at the business. Can you talk about some of the hesitancy, if you saw any, in the businesses that you all worked with and some of the ways that you were able to help them overcome uh, that hesitancy? And I say that because I'm hoping that maybe it'll resonate with someone that may be listening today and may not be uh, willing to take advantage of those resources when they're provided to them, but to share with them how that could change the trajectory of their business. Well, as I said earlier, when you come from a low wealth underserved community, you know, there are a lot of pain points. And so when you get to a certain point in your business, you know, you've made a lot of mistakes because you don't have the resources. You've made some bad decisions because you don't have resources. We think many decisions and pain points that a entrepreneur and founder encounters is because of lack of resources. And so when you say to an entrepreneur, let's look at your financial statements. What, I, what we talked about, Joselle, getting under the hood, I think they're embarrassed. They're ashamed, okay? And what we have to do is get them to understand that the only way that we're going to be able to help them is that we have to get under the hood. As I say and joke about, we have to check the engine oil. We gotta look at the tires. If there's a leak in that engine, eventually it's going to die, right? And if so, so I think if entrepreneurs are listening today, they have to get over how they started. The question is now is how do they want to scale and grow, right? And, and you can correct your past, but you cannot correct that past unless you become truthful and honest. And as Joselle been using the word resilient of that past, and resilient of your future, only then can you have the changes and scale to the level that you should that is commensurate with your aspirations. And so I really encourage everyone, get some help. 
Let other people help you. You know, if you have it, you're sitting there with a low credit score because of various different challenges, challenges that can be corrected. Go ahead and rebuild it and get some help with it. If your balance sheet, you got a negative retain earning, that can be turned around. And this is the time to do it because the economy is still coming out of it. And this is the time to get help. There are many executives, I am certain in the, in the Memphis area, like here in Philadelphia, that is still working from home, that you could get them to be your mentor. You know, when people was flying everywhere for meetings, that's not taking place now. This is a really good time to build your network, get you a new set of team of advisors to work with you. And you only as good as the experts that you surround yourself with. If you do not have a strong management team and you making all the decisions by yourself, that probably is not a good place to be in. I know for myself as a leader of the Enterprise Center, I'm only as good as the people I surround myself with. And so, Joselle, I know that I need a good team. You know, they say you can have dreams, but if you don't have a good team, you can't achieve those dreams. So I encourage everyone to get themselves a good team. And that's an internal team and an external team. Absolutely. Great advice. Great advice. Now, any, I'll ask, do any more questions? No questions, no raised hands. You have a great person here today that's chatting with me and chatting with us. Um, I take advantage of this opportunity to uh, ask her questions. So uh, before I close out, let's talk a bit about uh, your SBIC. You talked about CDFIs and, and the when someone should look at a CDFI. So let's talk a bit about SBICs and when business owners should go to an SBIC. Well, this, that's an interesting part of our discussion because many minorities are afraid of equity. They think that someone is going to take control of their business. But, but the small businesses and particularly minority businesses have to understand is that you cannot grow with all debt and have an exit strategy at some point to exit out. Because if you have a balance sheet full of debt and you reach 65 and you want to sell your business, you then, whatever amount of money you receive, it's just like if you buy a house and you have a lot of different second mortgages and third mortgages on your house. If you sell your house, all of those mortgages have to be paid off. And then you only left with the net proceed. So it's the same case with your business. If you have a lot of debt on your books and you get ready to sell your business or merge with someone, then you got to pay off all that debt most likely. And so which means, will you have anything to retire with? I like to always use the story of uh, Robert Johnson from BET. When he started BET, he started with about $12,000. And he, when he grew that business, he recognized that he had to sell uh, shares of it to raise money to give him working capital. But what he did was in every single agreement, when he sold those shares, he put in first rights of refusal, which means no one could buy those shares or sell those shares without his permission. And so before he sold uh, BET to Viacom, he built his business, he saved his money, and then he went back and bought all those shares. And so when he sold to Viacom, he was almost at 100% back in ownership of his business. You have to learn strategy. You have to learn the capital market. So one of the reasons, Joselle, is that we started the SBIC is because we were looking at too many balance sheets with too much debt. Okay, and what we found out is that when you have a lot of debt, you are a risk manager because 30 days come awful fast in those principal and interest payments. Whereas mm -hmm. if you have equity, you have a period of time to use that equity and you can be an innovator. As we talked about hot industry, you, you can invest in them because you don't have principal interest payment. Yes, you will have to grow your business value to take out your investors because they will want to return. But what's wrong with that? You were able to use their money for a period of time. So I would encourage this group to really begin to understand equity. There is a difference between venture capital. Venture capital is really associated with early stage companies, primarily tech and biotech. Private equity is structured more for more mature firms and it's more structured deals. That's why we decided to do an SBIC, which kind of falls in between. And so our investment thesis is for minority enterprises. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'm glad you were able to expound on it. Uh, I'm going to ask again, 
Any questions in the chat? No, we have a shy bunch this morning. So not asking a lot of questions, uh, but everybody listening knows that after this event, they know how to contact us to follow up if you have any questions uh, or if you would like some additional uh, information. So as we close this morning, the only thing I can say is, wow, uh, we had a morning filled with powerful insight. We had inclusive perspectives from around the globe uh, and around the country. Della from right here uh, in the U.S. from Philadelphia. Uh, earlier this morning, we had Christine Self, who brought us perspective, as I told you at the start of this discussion, uh, from 2,600 companies across the country. Uh, and in this new reality, we are on a journey of recovery and resiliency for businesses and communities. There's no one person, entity, or government that has a patent on that solution. Uh, as it has been and will continue to be, it will take the collective efforts of us all to marshal our resources to ensure we have the supplies needed for the journey. From Memphis to Philadelphia and around the globe, we're calling upon minority and small businesses to build resilient organizations and look for opportunities to expand your markets into new industries, new geographic regions. Even if it is across town, to partner, merge, or acquire new businesses. Equipped with the tools, information, and resources, we can survive the journey. And so I wanna thank you for tuning in, but I do wanna take a minute because we do have a couple of minutes. I wanna take a minute uh, and talk to the participants about how to navigate this platform. If you are new to this BFAIRS platform this year, there are a couple of things that I want you to know. As you know, right now we are in the auditorium. All of our workshops, all of our speakers, all of our luncheons will be held here in the auditorium. Once you leave the auditorium, you can go to the networking lounge. And the networking lounge is really a great place to hang out in between sessions because you can look and identify and see other people that are in the networking lounge. You can click on them, uh, engage them in several different ways. Uh, you can send text messages via chat. You can even have an audio or a video chat with them. The exhibit hall is open all day today. You can go and you can visit the booths. Most, many booths have videos. They might have, if you click on a banner, it might take you to their website. You can explore the website to learn how to do business with them. They might have forms to punch out that you would fill out vendor, uh, supplier uh, information. They may have collateral material that you can grab and drop and drag in. So you can visit the booths today, but tomorrow between two and four, the booths will be manned. So there's, there will be no representatives at the booths today. They will be there from two to four tomorrow. But take your time and visit the booths and develop your strategy of who you want to speak with and engage tomorrow. Also, um, you can spend time. So we have the exhibit hall. We have the networking lounge. You come back to the auditorium. Stop by the, um, stop by the um, information desk. You can um, see the flip through the sponsor book, look at the ads that were presented. You can also see the schedule of other events. If you wanna see the sponsor messages and videos, go out in the lobby, click on their banners. Many of you, I don't know if you found the leaderboard yet. Uh, you need to click on the leaderboard. We have some wonderful prizes today. I don't have a list in front of me, but we have everything from a wireless speaker to two tickets to the Southern Heritage football game between the Jackson State University and Tennessee State uh, University. We have a surprise gift from the Grizzlies. We have gift cards that have been provided by some of our corporate members and some of our minority businesses. We have tons of gifts that we will give away, prizes that we'll give away at the end of the day. So click on the leaderboard and, and figure out what you have to do and where you have to visit on this platform in order to earn points. And so the prizes will be awarded based on the points secured. So navigate around, uh, visit all the sites, check the leaderboard uh, so you can have an opportunity to win, win these great prizes. So with that, in about three minutes, we will open and come back to you for our virtual luncheon.